It's recording. Let's right, share. It's sharing. <clears throat> okay. Um, where are we now? Um, right. That's done. Okay, um, so we're <clears throat> um, kind of in, in the slowly approaching the final stretch of the course, and we're going to do some really cool stuff at the very end. Um, well, we're still working on this uh, kind of computer based uh, chemistry stuff, chemical informatics, and we're going to do a couple of fun things today. Um, that I think you're you would be able to go along or um, kind of do almost simultaneously or or I think it'll be part of a one of the upcoming homework assignments doing this idea of virtual synthesis for example um, but let's let's uh, um, let's start with a little bit on virtual screening and sort of computational modeling in general and we'll we'll talk a little bit about this in silico synthesis also. All right. Um, all right. Here we go. Okay. So computational methods and drug discovery. I mean, we've been doing a little bit of this already. Even just talking about smiles as a chemical uh, structure format and using tools to figure out drug likeness and um, you know biological properties and what are some other computational methods, I guess, in drug discovery? I mean, computers are pretty amazing now, and I certainly didn't have, you know, much of this when I was when I was growing up, or like at at, at uh, when I was in your stage of uh, your career, the internet was barely even existing. <laughs> it's pretty crazy, um, but but now there's tools to do all sorts of aspects of like um, uh, predicting drug binding to proteins and things like that. And let's talk about some of those things. Virtual screening, um, what is that? It's, so virtual screening um, can mean various things. Uh, mostly in drug discovery, it, it's a computational technique to search libraries of small molecules, um, often using docking. Docking is a, is a th technique of sort of three-dimensional modeling of a, of a molecule interacting with a protein to identify molecules that bind to a drug target. That sounds pretty cool. Um, I, and it's not something I can really go into extreme depth into in this course, just because it is a, it is a big can of worms. Um, but there are some nice resources on the web and even YouTube videos and free, free tools to do docking that we'll mention um, if, you, if you wanna do it like in your research. But me going through it all, it's, it's, it's like a pretty, pretty uh, substantial thing. But we'll, we'll, we'll show some docking results, for example. Um, so yeah, <laughs> a little computer doing all the work of drug screening. It's, it's kind of cool. I mentioned that in, my, in, my, uh, in the pandemic lockdown, I, I basically, me and a collaborator used docking to discover inhibitors, real, real inhibitors, validated inhibitors, of COVID-19 protease, um, which is just one, one example, but people do docking all the time. And if you're able to back up your docking with biological screening, it makes it a little more, um, um, I guess, realistic. It's easy to come up with kind of bad, bad docking results. <laughs> there are a lot of bad docking results in the literature. Okay, um, what's the, if we're thinking about screening, drug screening, what's the alternative? Uh, high throughput screening 
is kind of like the traditional approach. Um, the definition is experimental technique to identify molecules that bind to a drug target. It requires a high throughput screening assay and it requires massive libraries of purified compounds. So which is the cheap method? Yeah, virtual screening is pretty cheap because everything's free, including the compounds. You can download the compounds off the, um, off the internet in, in SMILES format, right? We know SMILES now, it's a chemical structure format. So I can download literally every compound on the planet um, as SMILES for free. It's, it, there's, there's libraries of this on, on the web. Um, and, and particularly, I could either do every compound or like commercially available compounds or compounds by a particular vendor because there's a lot of vendors and some of the vendors are cheap. Some of the vendors are expensive. So you can kind of pick your vendors properly. Okay, so um, <clears throat> which is better? I mean, well, it's, it depends on what you mean by better. I mean, I think it, in terms of an experimentally validated technique, high throughput screening is pretty, pretty good and it's used by all the drug companies. Um, yeah, you know, um, but if you, you can use virtual screening, maybe in, in um, you know, in addition to high throughput screening and kind of use both of them, them as techniques to find inhibitors of enzymes um, pretty effectively. A lot of people don't have the equipment to do high throughput screening. So they'll kind of work on virtual screening. That makes sense. You might even be able to do assays, but not um, necessarily have all the robots because high throughput screening usually requires liquid handling robots and kind of uh, just, um, like it kind of kind of fancy equipment, okay? Uh, where do we get compounds? Well, for virtual screening, um, for virtual screening, there's again libraries that we can just download them. And a good one is actually at UCSF. It's called UCSF Zinc. It has about 230 million compounds that are accessible. Uh, maybe I'll open up a browser, could it go over there? UCSF Zinc database. This is a pretty cool resource. Um, and um, basically through, you have to kind of navigate through this, this tool, but uh, there's, they have different catalogs for um, different vendors. So all of these are chemical companies. I can basically download any of these chemical companies. Uh, they're all of the compounds and like, my collaborators at UCSF, um, they, um, they have a special deal with ChemDiv, this company, which has a ton of compounds. And, and so like we can get ChemDiv compounds really cheaply. So when I'm picking vendors to use, I'd probably pick ChemDiv because I can get the chemicals cheaply. You know, um, getting obviously every chemical <laughs> would be possible also. Eventually it's kind of hard to deal with millions or hundreds of millions of compounds. So, so picking subsets of compounds is, is kind of um, a way to go. Some compounds are totally free. Um, I think they have it here somewhere, like the, the National Institute of Health has, has their own little subsets of compounds, the NIH, um, or maybe I think the National Cancer Institute, where you can actually get free compounds. So you can get the structures for free and then the compounds for free. I think, um, is it here somewhere? Yeah, these NIH and NCI clinical co collections, these are compounds that are uh, basically freely available, you know, provided by the government. It actually shows subsets of them too. Anyway, um, if you get into this stuff, you'll probably use zinc. I just wanted to show what it is, um, but it's a, it's a nice electronic depository of, Compounds. Okay, now it can be, I can feed them right into my docking programs and then and then do docking against, you know, a protein tar drug target or something. Um, some of the vendors, Cambridge, Chemdiv, Enamine, Sigma Aldrich, um, and yeah, UCSF, UCSF Zinc um, is that, that database I was just talking about. I, I personally, you know, in terms of just a nice general sampling of commercially commercially available compounds, I think Cambridge, ChemDiv, and Enamine are, are, are pretty good 
collection. Um, okay, so what's this in silico synthesis thing I'm talking about? In silico synthesis, synthesize libraries of molecules in the computer. Um, why is that useful? Well, I mean, if you're trying to find a drug, trying to design a drug, um, in addition to everything that's commercially available, right? In addition to everything that's commercially available, all 230 million compounds. Um, I mean, if some, some, chemi some reactions are really easy, right? Uh, there's react the amide coupling, right? Right. We talk about amide coupling, how, how carboxylic acid and amine can be attached. Well, that's so easy that an undergrad can do it, right? So, say that I have a, a piece of a molecule that I, I know is good, like I'm part of the, you know, contributes to activity. Wouldn't it be nice just to make a whole bunch of variations of it, and then screen those variations? maybe by virtual screening. That's kind of the idea of in silico synthesis is I can make a virtual library of molecules, a virtual library, and then I can maybe do virtual screening on the virtual library. And then as a synthetic chemist, and you know, with, with these easy reactions, you guys could be synthetic chemists too. I could actually make the best of the best that are found in, the, in through docking or whatever. So that's actually a pretty cool idea. And it's not that hard because certain reactions are really easy to do, right? So in silico synthesis means make molecules in the computer. Yeah, make uh, libraries of molecules in the computer. Okay. It's a great source of molecular libraries. Okay. Okay, so what else? Um, Computational docking, I already mentioned that, is a, th a technique where a 3D molecule is fitted into a 3D structure, usually a protein, in a minimal energy conformation, right? You don't want maximal energy. You want, you want it to fit nicely and complement, complementarily. And um, so a lot of what docking is, there's two, kind of two components of it, right? There's the molecule getting moved through 3D space into the receptor. And then there's also an accurate energy calculation, right? There needs to be a good calculation of the energy. Is it, is it low energy? Is it high energy? Is there stuff bumping into other stuff? All of that will you know, let you figure out if, if that's a good complementary interaction, or maybe it's you're trying to jam something in into the, the receptor that doesn't fit, right? So, so that's kind of like, those are the two things you need to do, do you know, but it's all automated, which is cool. Docking is, is a, you know, there's some uh, many, many way, ways to do uh, a docking, but generally speaking, it's all done automatically. So you just provide the receptor, you provide your molecules and it does all the work. Some of the methods are better than others, though, and there's a lot of uh, debate on what what's the good, what are the good docking methods. Um, so where do we get the protein structure from? Any ideas? That you might have some ideas. Where where do we get a, a computerized uh, uh, protein structure? So somebody sent me uh, a couple of people said PDB. Yeah, totally, totally. Well, PDB. What's the PDB? The PDB is a collection of um, protein crystal structures for the most part, but there's also protein, there's other things aside from crystallography, there's uh, electron microscopy, there's other ways you can get a protein structure. What if your protein does not, it, does, it doesn't work? What if you have a protein that doesn't crystallize? You can't do x-ray crystallography on a protein that doesn't crystallize, right? So, so then what do you do? And there's a lot of proteins, a lot of proteins that don't have X-ray crystal structures. So then somebody said a computer model, and then that's right. Yeah, you can basically create a computer model of a protein. We're, and we're getting better at this. The, the, the word is actually called homology modeling. And um, so yeah, PDB is the published collection of X-ray crystal structures. Not every protein has a PDB structure. And there's also, um, also there's additional techniques besides from X-ray crystallography. So electron microscopy is kind of an, you know, a, another, another way to get 
uh, crystal or uh, uh, protein structures if you can't get good crystals. Because most X-ray crystal structures require good protein crystals. Okay. So then there's this concept of homology modeling. It's a useful alternative to estimate a 3D structure of a protein using the protein sequence and homologous 3D protein templates. That's a, that's a mouthful. What, what does that mean? Um, have you seen this? I don't. I, I'm. So I ask students all the time, and I get various answers. Like, have you have you heard of homology modeling? It's a, it's a pretty cool technique. And I think a lot, oftentimes I'm the first person that introduces people to this idea. Um, but uh, yeah, it's basically, I mean, think about a protein amino acid sequence, right? You should almost be able to take the amino acid sequence and figure out a three-dimensional structure of a protein, right? Using, I mean, how does that happen? I mean. We, we understand protein structure quite well. And we also kind of over, you know, decades and decades and decades, know, we know, we know, kind of know like what amino acids cause an alpha helix and what amino acids call it, cause a beta sheet, all those kind of things. And wouldn't it be cool just to automatically just take a protein sequence, spit it into a computer program, and then come up with a three dimensional structure of the protein? I mean, that's a pretty wild thing. And, and, and that's been, that people have been doing that for a while and and it's actually not that difficult so i'm going to try I'll, I'll, I'll even do it while we're on online here one second um uh somebody said does computer modeling count the ligand does computer modeling count the ligand um i think what the what the the students asking me is does the homology modeling maybe model like a ligand binding? And, and it, usually the answer is no. Uh, if I'm gonna do, if I wanna model a ligand binding and I don't have a protein crystal structure, first I gotta make the protein crystal structure, or I'm sorry, not, not, the, not the crystal structure, the homology model or whatever. First I need to model of the protein and then I have to do docking separately. So it's usually a, a two-step process. Okay. What do we mean by homologous 3D protein template? Homologous 3D protein template. What that means is if I have protein A, and I'm trying to model the structure of protein A, and there's no crystal structure or electron microscopy, or I just don't find it in the PDB, right? I have a protein. It's not in the PDB. What do I do? So homology modeling, what it usually does is it will look for homologous proteins that have a similar sequence, or you know, it might be a different species. It might be a different isoform. It might be you know, a different family member, but that may have a structure. So if I have a good template and then I have mine, then homology modeling works pretty good, right? So I can, so if that makes any sense. So usually you need something to base the homology model on. And again, this is all automated too, so it's really cool. Um, if there's nothing homologous whatsoever, it might still even create a model, but it might not be a very good model, right? There's a lot of bad homology models out there. It all kind of depends on how, how good the templates are, right? Okay, but I guess the, the, the thing that is really cool about this is that um, people are solving structures of proteins all the time, right? Electron microscopy, x-ray crystal structures. It's just a continuous uh, research effort. And so if I, if today I try modeling my protein and there's nothing because there's no good templates, what if I wait a year? Oh, well, within that year, maybe more people have solved other things that are, resemble my protein and then a good homology model can be created. So it's like you can, often, often you just kind of, you know, you, you try it, doesn't work. Okay, wait, wait six months, wait a year, try again, and maybe something better happens. I've actually had this happen recently in some of my projects where, where there was nothing, nothing homologous at all, like a, a few years ago. And then, and then gradually things are coming, coming, uh, being published. And now I can create a good homology model. Okay. 
All right, so uh, so yeah, it only really works if there's good homologous 3D protein templates, right? Okay, so overview of virtual screening and docking, that concept. Um, this is just a, a little kind of cartoon diagram. Uh, you, you would have either a single molecule or maybe a library of molecules that you're trying to dock. And then you need a, a protein, which is either created through homology modeling or structural biology. Um, structural biology basically means X-ray crystallography <laughs> or, or um, uh, electron microscopy. And then the docking basically finds a good docking pose of your molecule into a receptor site. Obviously finding a receptor site is kind of difficult too, because um, it's not always obvious where, where a, a molecule might fit. But if you have a, a lot of proteins will have little cavities and pockets where small molecules can fit. <clears throat> Now, often the docking programs will actually search to the surface of the protein automatically and look for a little, little hole that, a, that, a, uh, that a, a molecule can fit into, right? So, there, so that's often part of the docking program is finding a re receptor finding, right? You have to find the receptor. And then, uh, but, but um, as, a, as a process, you could do docking and virtual screening combined with you know, a, a protein structure, and then you get something, and then that'll inspire you to go back and maybe do synthesis, right? And so you, as a synthetic chemist, we can then make, make variations of the molecule and be like, oh, well, maybe I shot a chlorine here or a bromine here or a methyl there. And then that, that may actually improve not only the docking, but it may improve the biological activity too, right? So, so I guess the point is this, this is a cyclic process. This can go around in a circle. It could be go around in a circle for years and years and years, right? Of, of like kind of iteratively trying to improve a drug's binding. Um, somebody asked in the comments, can, can a previous literature work help find an active site? And that's, yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, you should be familiar with the, the literature of your project. And, and I think, um, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, um, some people, some, maybe somebody else did docking work, so you could maybe use their inspiration. Uh, the other thing about, about it is, um, um, like, where, how else can you find where, where the receptor is? If there, you know, if there is a, a small molecule receptor. Um, well, remember that COVID paper in the homework? Um, well, that was called a co-crystal structure. So you had a protein co-crystallized with a inhibitor, right? Well, that, <laughs> then you know that's, that's the active site, right? So that's actually, that's usually a ni nice way also. If, if, if there is a good X-ray crystal structure and they crystallize the protein with the molecule bound to it, then you then you have a good idea of what the where the receptor is because it's it's given to you, and then your your docking program will use that and be like oh well that's where the inhibitor is so we'll just use that as the, the receptor, right? Uh, but there's also the idea of an allosteric binding site. You guys heard that maybe somewhere allosteric binding site. That's an idea where you have a protein with a with a receptor. But then there's a, like on the other opposite side of the protein, there's some other other binding site, and that, that happens frequently too. So um, so sometimes you have a, a primary binding site and also like an allosteric binding site. Okay, cool. Um, examples of homology modeling tools. All right, because it's it is a pretty popular thing, and, and there are some free ones on online actually that, that we can use. Uh, I'm going to do this one in a second, Swiss tools. I'm going to do the mark demo of it. Uh, there's also something called Yasara. I actually, I own this one. Um, I pay a, a few hundred dollars every year to keep the subscription going. It's a really nice program, uh, Yasara. I've, I've actually developed pretty good homology models using Yasara. Um, there's something called Modeler. That I think is free also, um, but I think you need a... Um, a uh, like an academic site license or something. 
uh, something called Fire. I think that one's also free too. So, so all of these I think are actually free except Yasara, which I, I paid for. Um, let's, oh yeah, so let's try, let's try Swiss tools real quick. Um, okay, all right, so let's, let me see here. I'm gonna go to PubMed, uh, something called PubMed Protein. What's PubMed Protein? Um, PubMed Protein is a tool that I can basically find a protein amino acid sequence. So I can search for the name of a protein and like a species and then, um, and then get the amino acid sequence. Because remember with homology modeling, you need the protein amino acid sequence first. So uh, the one I'm gonna use is a, a something called SLC26A3, which is one of my research proteins. Um, and we're gonna search for the human version of it because it's in all mammals. So let's find the human version of this protein, SLC26A3. Um, so at the top, it's, it, um, um, oh, somebody said, somebody asked a great question. Somebody asked a great question. And the question was about PubMed. Um, the question was, I always use it for literature. I didn't know you can search for proteins too. That's a great, a great observation. PubMed is a huge thing. And in addition to literature, you can search for literature on PubMed. You can also search for proteins. You can also search for a million other things. There's this whole like little tab here of things that you can find in PubMed. Um, I can find like uh, uh, genes. I can, I can actually download like the DNA sequence of proteins and things like that. Another one that's kind of cool is structure, PubMed structure. Um, this is essentially the PDB, so I can I can search for what, what's one that we've done before, like um, biotin strip. Uh, one STP is a one the biotin streptavidin one. For some reason, I memorized that one. <laughs> but it was uh, PubMed structure allows you to uh, obtain PDB files, and the PDB files are right here in the download. And this is actually, remember I, that thing, ICN3D, our little tool for viewing uh, proteins? That's all kind of linked from PubMed. <laughs> so this asymmetric unit thing, and I, I go to the viewer, remember that all the stuff we've done. This is all basically the NIH for us. It's a it's government-funded uh, tool. This is ICN3D is a government-funded uh, protein viewer, okay? Okay, let's go back, 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 back. Okay, so anyway, um, yeah, so I'm gonna go to uh, PubMed Protein. And what this does is lets me search for proteins. Um, so I'm gonna look for SLC26A3 human. So I've got the human isoform as opposed to mouse or rat or something like that. Um, up top's the gene, I, I want the protein. I think the one I've been using is the second one, uh, chloride anion exchanger, homo sapiens. So if I, and I can see, it tells you how many amino acids there are, 764. Okay. Um, so I, this has a little bit of information on the protein and, and its discovery, some literature references, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but down at the bottom is the amino acid sequence. So I can just take this, copy it, control C. Um, I'm gonna go to Swiss tools, which is the one of the homology modeling tools. I search for Swiss tools homology. That usually gets me there. Um, it's, it's called, I guess, Swiss model, Swiss model. And I say start modeling. And I tried this a few minutes ago and it worked. I, I, had, to, I had to play around with the amino acid sequence. I, I just paste it in. And I think it, let's see, it, it says it's complaining that the sequence must be greater than 30 residues, which of course it is. I think what I, let me try validate. No, this doesn't work. Okay, the way I fixed, the way I got mine to work 
was I deleted all the, the little one, the, the, the numbers. Just delete the delete, 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 et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Just delete those amino acid marker numbers. <clears throat> oh, somebody said you can use look at the uniprot numbers. Yeah, I think there's a yeah, there's another way to get the amino acid sequence that avoids this. This takes a few seconds though. So there we go. Yeah, there's way there's other ways to import the amino acid sequence. Okay, so there we go. Now I have the protein in there. I think I click validate and it's now it's okay. I'm gonna call this a Marcus blob. Oh, it actually, yeah, it's saying it's pre-calculated meaning cause I did this 30 minutes ago. It's already, it's already done, but I'll, I'm just gonna pretend uh, that just to show you, yeah, it's I basically it's entered my email address. And then, and then I just hit build model um and then about 15 minutes later it comes up with a model I, i'm just i'm gonna just show you uh what that model looks like oops One second. Okay, this is what this is eventually what what that uh, Swiss model created, and it actually created this three dimensional model of the you know it's a pretty complicated uh, channel protein, a chloride channel, and um, and then actually even, even predicted where the membrane would reside because it's membrane channel proteins go through membranes, right? The bottom is the cytoplasmic region, so it's like the inside of the cell. The top is the extracellular, extracellular region. Uh, this protein resides in the intestinal lumen. So um, basically intestinal cells. And, um, and anyway, and then, and then, and then I'm also, I, I'm able to download it. I think it was this, I download the archive and that, that, that basically has a link to the PDB file. I'll show that real quick too. Um, where is it? Yeah, so I, I was able to download it and like import it into Pymol or whatever tool I, I like to use it this for. And then it's a pretty nice kind of reasonable uh, protein structure of this pretty complicated channel protein. And it created in about, in about 15 minutes, which is pretty cool. So there's a nice thing, you you know, if, if nothing else, like for, if, you, if in your research project, you have proteins, you can get a nice cartoon diagram of a protein pretty rapidly with this, right? Okay, cool. So, so that was a little demo of Swiss tools. Um, these are a model and fire are also pretty, pretty nice too. Um, docking programs, if you do end up docking in your research, a couple of the programs that are pretty popular are uh, Autodoc Vina. That's actually, I believe this is totally free. Um, and there's a, a million YouTube tutorials on it and also is web tutorials. Um, something called OE Docking and Fred. I, I have these ones. Um, they are commercial products, but I have a, a site license for them. Um, uh, Yasara, that program I, I was talking about before, it also does docking, something called Glide. There's a, there's a whole bunch of programs. A lot of them are very expensive and even, even for academic use, I would say too expensive, <laughs> for, certainly for me. So I, I try to focus on things that are free and um, Autodoc Vino is pretty cool though. So um, you, you might check that out on YouTube if you're interested in doing some docking. Um, if you if you actually want to do docking and research, uh, you can also talk to me. I, I can uh, I might be able to help out a little bit and, and steer you in the right direction. Um, okay, so overview of these automated homology modeling tools. 
we, I just showed you what it does. Um, how does it work? How does it work? Um, so it's kind of a, it's a multi-step process. It's all pretty much all automated, which is cool. Um, you import the protein sequence like we did, and it basically recognizes um, sequences and aligns them with different templates. And sometimes, sometimes multiple templates will be used. So like one part of your protein aligns with one template, another part of your protein aligns with a different template. And then it can kind of uh, start attaching them together and figuring out the, the, the um, different kinds of uh, secondary structure and maybe tertiary structure of the, of the protein. Um, and it, it also, it, 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 like it, say there's uh, the align, it does a, 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 a sequence alignments. Sometimes it'll see, align the sequence but there'll be amino acids that are added or deleted. So it has to kind of correct for that also. Um, so then uh, through this process, eventually um, the main components of the secondary structure are developed and kind of modeled. And then loops are created for, for like that attach the secondary structure. So it's all kind of fancy computer um, mod three-dimensional modeling. And that, that basically builds all of the regions of the protein from the first amino acid to the very last amino acid. And, and, and after that's done, then it starts adding all the amino acids, basically every atom of the protein. And then, and then after that's done, it actually allows this to minimize. So it's kind of like a, a, a small molecular dan dynamics uh, simulation that allows all the amino acid residues to you know, avoid bumping into each other and just kind of find a, a optimal low energy conformation. Um, and, then, and then it can do this sort of iteratively. So the, the model can be, will be validated by the program. And if there's some issues with it, it might try again and it might try to improve them. Also like, um, you know, the, the uh, me as the user, I, I can kind of evaluate the, the model and look for consistency with experiment. And, and you know, there's, there's, there's definitely like problem structures and you can either uh, fix them or just you know, throw away the model and try something else. Or I can try a different program, right? We have like multiple programs. Um, Somebody asked, does this take into consideration DSSP? What's DSSP? I'm sorry, that's I don't I'm not I don't know what that um, acronym is. Um, uh, the second secondary model structure. Um, so I mean this this will this should be able to um, predict pretty much. Well, if it works and you have proper templates, it should be able to predict the the uh, the secondary and tertiary structure of the protein, and um, and um, and also like predict like dimer structures. I mean, you, we saw the model I just created for my my protein. It actually predicted that it was a homodimer between two two molecules. And that, that happens to be the, like a low energy confirmation of it. So, um, so, so basically, um, well, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's an improving technology and it all kind of depends on having good templates, okay? Okay, molecular dynamics, we talked about that a little bit. It's a, a computer simulation method for analyzing physical movements of atoms and molecules. Like in a protein, or maybe DNA, or you know, for an extended amount of time, is that? I mean, that's only a few words, but that's actually very complicated, right? As a computational, uh, as a computational um, process, it's really difficult to simulate all the atoms in a protein because there's so many atoms. So it's like a, it's like a kind of a. Uh, uh, computational, uh, computationally challenging process, right? If you have a huge protein, not only do you have the protein, but also like all the water molecules and things like that, 
that's a lot of atoms and, and trying to simulate the movement of everything over an extended period of time is actually kind of a difficult thing. And so you, you can usually need kind of fancy computer equipment, somewhat fancy computer equipment, but it's, it all, it's all available. I mean, maybe a thousand dollars of computer equipment or something like that. Um, it's a slower computationally demanding process than docking. Docking is actually really fast. Uh, because you know, if you have a if you have a static protein and and, and like the molecule can maybe rotate around a bit, that's not that much movement, right? When you have a whole protein that's that's moving around and all the amino acid side chains are moving around and the water molecules or whatever, that's actually a much more challenging process. Um, what can you do with MD? Uh, MD is molecular dynamics. Um, some of the things you can envision doing are look at the like target oriented, um, meaning kind of like the drug target, like the protein. You can kind of like study the dynamics of the protein itself and the conformational space, meaning what is, that? What is conformational space? It means all of the different uh, variations of the protein structure over time, right? Because the protein structure is kind of wiggling around and all the amino acids are moving around. And you can kind of, um, that is kind of helpful if you, if a protein has maybe different, like very different conformations, right? Maybe, maybe certain alpha helixes change in one situation, change back in a different situation. And you can, you can basically study that with MD. The other thing, and I, this is what maybe excites me a little bit more, is is ligand oriented um, molecular dynamics. Because I I'm I like making I like trying to trying to make drugs and and you know simulate uh, uh, inhibitor binding to proteins. So this is like using MD to kind of study how ligands bind and maybe the energetics of ligand binding and. Um, that's actually fascinating to me. And I, I, we've, we've done this for multiple projects um, and it's a really, really cool thing. I have some examples here in a second. Uh, there's a review article on, on kind of the general use of molecular dynamics um, in different types of projects. Uh, this was just a, a random example I found. Um, it was a very, specific use of MD to study uh, the uh, GPCR follic follicle stimulating hormone receptor, FSHR. It, uh, all the GPCRs, remember, they bind to something on the extracellular side, like a ligand. And then, and then that causes a, the protein, well, some changes in the protein structure. And then that causes, uh, phosphorylation of proteins on the other side, in, in, inside the cell basically, right? And um, abnormalities of this protein cause uh, infertility in women. Um, so what this paper did, and, and if you, you can read the paper if you're interested, PLOS One 2018, um, is it really studied the dynamics of this and how a molecule binding on the outside can cause structural effects that um, lead to a, a, an effect on the inside of the molecule, or inside of the, the cell. It's pretty amazing, right? That a little thing on the outside can change something on, on the other side of the protein. And so MD is pretty good at those kind of things, right? Um, and again, what I, what I usually use MD for in my own research is like, we'll, you, we'll, we'll basically do docking and we'll, we'll find a docked conformation of a, a protein in, a, a ligand into a protein. And then we'll study the docked conformation with MD uh, to, you know, look at energetics of binding and things like that. Um, oh yeah, let's do in silico virtual synthesis. So we talked about that a little bit. It's like the idea of doing synthesis like in a computer. Okay, so we're gonna do this brief demonstration on in silico synthesis. Um, and the definition again of this, is virtual synthesis of organic molecules or big libraries of molecules via computer rather than in, in the laboratory. Of course, it's really easy to do a lot of synthesis in the laboratory, especially if the reactions are easy, like making an amid. <laughs> making an amid is one of the easiest things in the world to do. Um, 
recall, well, we're gonna, as an example of this, recall our, from our homework, the synthesis of those notch one and notch three inhibitors. It was a cancer drug target, right? That was that paper, maybe homework two, or maybe homework two. Um, remember this reaction? So starts with the amine on the left, carboxylic acid on the right. Uh, we used ET3N, a triethylamine and HBTU as a uh, coupling sequence to create the amide, right? Um, the mechanism is really simple of all of these reactions. Base essentially takes off the protein, pro <laughs> protein. Base takes off the proton off the carboxylic acid, makes it carboxylate, attacks HPTU, um, and essentially creates a leaving group number one. And then, and then it happens again to create leaving group number two. And then the amine attacks the carbon and kicks off HOBT uh, to uh, create the amide. Okay, so what we're gonna do is let, like, you know, we, we know that this is a, a good molecule. In, in reality though, remember there, there's, and I mentioned this on, on iLearn, uh, this is not the final drug. They do a, uh, a couple step process at the very end. They take off the terbutyl ester to make a carboxylic acid. And then they take the carboxylic acid and they make a, pr a primary amide. So the final drug is actually NH2, but we're, we're gonna ignore that for now. Um, but anyway, like given this, like say that the left part is really what binds, binds the, most importantly to the drug, uh, sorry, to the uh, uh, protein, right? Then could we just make a, a thousand variations using a thousand carboxylic acids? The answer is yes, we can. I mean, we, we, we can do that and we can do it very rapidly in the computer program. Likewise, say that the right side is the most important part for binding to the, to the protein. Say the right side is this, the, you know, these weird uh, trifluoropropyl groups, maybe the primary amide. I'd actually, if I was betting money, I'd probably say that the right side is probably the more important thing with this chirality and stuff. Um, could we just take a thousand or a million amines and just feed them in? We can do that. And we're going to do that in a second. Um, and then if, if I have a good docking model, for example, then I can dock them. I can take my million products, million products, and dock them. And docking of million compounds I could do in 12 hours or something, right? So, and then I could actually create new ideas of how I might, uh, you know, modify this drug structure. Okay. This is just a cool example of this. Um, the IC50s were roughly two or three nanomolars against the notch uh, uh, receptor. Okay, um, all right, so we're gonna do this. Uh, so note the two building blocks are an amine and a carboxylic acid or formed through an amide linkage. The bond is created with a reagent HPTU. Amides are notoriously easy to make. We, you know, there's probably 20 ways we could come up with in case HPTU doesn't work. Um, in principle, the building blocks could be used to explore the effects of building block structure on activity, right? Um, we can do in silico synthesis easily and rapidly by computer and create virtual libraries based on either left piece or the right piece, okay? And we uh, then we might combine that with docking or something. Um, I, I'm not, I, again, docking is a little bit of a can of worms and we're not gonna do that. Uh, I also don't have a good protein structure for, for notch to even demonstrate that with. We just wanna demonstrate the, the concept of virtual synthesis. So, but we, we, the other thing is we can also like, if we can't do docking, at least we can maybe do, you know, check the Lipinski properties or something, right? That's easy, we, we get, we've done that already. So we can look, at least look like drug-like drug proper drug -like properties. So that's, that's something we can do. Um, to, and, and you can use that to remove on drug-like properties. Okay, so we're gonna do two things. Well, we're gonna actually do three things, but 
one, one virtual synthesis is we're gonna use alternate carboxylic acids. So we're gonna use a library of carboxylic acids to couple to the amine. Um, so for example, start with the left thing and use 15.7 million carboxylic acids from the enamine library. And that would make 15.7 million products, okay? Alternatively, I could use alternate amines. So I can use 22.2 million primary amines from the enamine collection and couple them using the computer to the carboxylic acid piece. And I, I you know, again, I, if, I was, if I was betting money on this, I would say this, this bottom one is probably the more, more likely to yield biologically active molecules. And we do in silico, in silico organic synthesis, also called virtual synthesis, and that would make 22.2 million products, okay? So, but we're gonna, to make this fast and easy, we're, we're gonna do a subset. We're gonna do 96 carboxylic acids on the top and 1100 amines, just, to, just because we don't really have the interest to do uh, you know, a million couplings. And it might, that might actually take more than a few minutes. Um, okay, so let's do this now. Uh, Oh yeah, yeah, this is another thing. Um, what's smiles again? Because uh, there's, there's other things besides smiles. There's smiles, there's smarts, and there's smirks. These are different text-based languages for different things. Smiles, of course, we know is, um, uh, that's a smile, smarts. <laughs> I was looking for a, a photo of what smart might be and I found a cat reading a book. And smirk is a, another one, all right. So what are these things? Um, smiles, we know, is a chemical structure format, right? Any guesses what smarts and smirks are? Do these have to do kind of with um, maybe um, with, um, well, smarts, what smarts is, is it is, it's a representation of like a substructure. So like a part of the molecule rather than the full molecule, just like the part of it, like the primary amine or like just the carboxylic acid, okay? Smirks is a, a representation for um, a chemical reaction. So I can actually encode a chemical reaction into a smirks string. So smiles is the, the organic structure of the starting material, right? One of these, they both have smart uh, smiles. And there they are, left one, right one. Smarts is a organic substructure, meaning a fragment or a functional group. I, and, and this website down here, if, you're, if you ever need to deal with smarts and smiles and smirks, this has a, a ton of useful examples for this. And it also defines the language. So this is at daylight.com. Okay, um, so amines and carboxylic acids have uh, smart strings. So this is the this is the kind of computer format for smarts of a uh, I think of a primary amine, which is basically this this thing up here. And a carboxylic acid that's the kind of, kind of computer representation of a carboxylic acid. So, all right, all right, and then smirks is a computer representation of a chemical reaction. Okay, and so of course. What is the chemical reaction we're doing up top? Well, we're reacting a amine and a carboxylic acid to make an amide, right? So then we would need the smarts of uh, amide, right? And, and basically what, what, this is what it is. Smirks for amide formation, I'll just show it right here. There it is. This weird series of letters is the, the, the smirks string for amine plus carboxylic acid to make an amide, okay? And you can see the little arrows, that's like where the reaction takes place. And I think on the right side, that's the what the uh, amide actually looks like is a, a smart string, okay? So that's what smiles, smarts, and smirks are. And then the other cool thing, like for any possible chemical reaction you might know, is there are smirk strings already written. So that's another thing you can get up daylight. So like an aldol condensation is a organic chemical reaction, right? Ketone aldehyde plus ketone or aldehyde to make a 
uh, alpha, beta, unsaturated, ketone, or whatever. It's just one of your organic two reactions. Yeah, so that has a nice Merck string also. So any reaction you can conceivably think of already has a Merck string. So you don't have to like create it. You just kind of look on, look on daylight.com and then go find that, that Merck string or, or Google it. Smirks for Diels Alder reaction or you know whatever you might want to do. Okay, so finally what we've been waiting for, demonstration of in silico virtual synthesis. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're going to um, examine this reaction, but we're also gonna do variations. So like a library of carboxylic acids with this amine or a library of amines with this carboxylic acid. Okay, there's the uh, smart uh, smiles. So, and we're also gonna use this uh, RD kit reaction numerator. This does all the hard work for us. It's at UC Irvine. Um, and so this, the, we're gonna, I'll show it in a second, reaction processor. Um, and I also have a library of 1121, 11,021 amines and 96 carboxylic acids ready to go. They're on my website. So I can just, I'll just get them off my, off my uh, website here in a second. Um, okay, so first thing we're gonna do is just the really boring reproduction of this reaction. And the next thing we'll do is we'll attach the amine with the 96 carboxylic acids. The next thing we'll do is attach the carboxylic acid with all the different amines. Um, and then let's, let's do that first. All right, so I'm gonna do the boring one first, just to take these two and, and uh, snap them together. So how do I do that? Um, Okay, so I just went to, uh, this is that UC Irvine website, uh, which has a whole bunch of chemical informatics tools. And we're gonna click the button reaction processor. Is that what it was? Reaction processor, yeah. Okay, so here's the reaction processor. So what I'm gonna do is delete the, the reactants in here, delete them all. We're also gonna delete the smirks, delete them all. Notice in the Smirks box, they, they have like a thousand different react, well, not a thousand, but maybe like 10 different reactions, amide formation, ester formation, Diels alder, nucleophilic acylation. All these are like chemical reactions with Smirk strings, but we're gonna just delete that and put our Smirk string in there, which is the, uh, it's on the previous slide. Then go get it. Okay, I just got, I copied it. It's the, this is the amide formation one that we, we were talking about. And then my reactants are, the top one is the amine. The bottom one is the carboxylic acid. All right, so we just have, basically put these two molecules in. We, we have a, a reaction defined with my smirks. Um, and I'm going to, I think what I've figured out is I want to, turn off include reactants um, here. Yeah, we do that. And I hit generate products. So this will carry out the chemical reaction. Um, and so the, it just created, it did, it did the reaction and now it created a, a smile string of the, the product. So this is the smile string. I could copy it into the 2D generator that we know and the 3D generator we know that's all in your, your homework. Right now, but, but I can also really quickly just look at the structure, view view the product, and ah, oh, look at that. There's there's the product, right? And it's got the terpene ester right now, and it, it also you know amide formation does create water because when you make the amine and the, from the make the amide from the carboxylic acid and the amine, you're, you're creating water. So it does show water that's a byproduct to there. Okay, all right. So that was fun. Now we're gonna do. Let's go back to uh, demo two now, attach the above amine with 96 carboxylic acids. To do that, I'm gonna delete the carbo this carboxylic acid, right? Keep the smirks, 
And now I go to my website and I have um, that link that I provided. And we're gonna go to the carboxylic acids filtered section. So this has a whole bunch of carboxylic acids that I, I, uh, I, I kind of pre-filtered and, and just kind of cut down the amount of them. Copy it, go back and uh, paste it right into the reactants box. So that, and what are these um, other codes? I think these are part numbers. Uh, these are chemdiv, I, chem, chemdiv or enamine. So these are part numbers. So if I want to purchase these carboxylic acids, they have these part numbers and I can look them up and find the pricing or whatever. Okay, so then I just hit generate products. And is it gonna work? Oh, there they are, yeah. Okay, so those are, the, those are all the products of that, the virtual library I just created. And I can also uh, view the structures. So these are all, right, the amine stayed constant and, uh, but the carboxylic acid changed. So the, the, we just created a virtual library of all of those, one amine coupled to all those carboxylic acids, right? In like a second. And, and you know, I, I, if I, depending on what I was doing, I could, I could dock this or, or do, do something else. Uh, usually docking would be the, the next step here. Um, okay, uh, but I'm gonna go back. Whoops, reaction process. Sorry, close this. Okay, um, and now just, just for fun, I'm gonna do the opposite orientation. I'm going to take the carboxylic acid, the second smile string, and I'm gonna uh, couple that with a whole bunch of amines that I have on my website also, okay? So first I need the carboxylic acid, so let me get that. One second. Okay, here we are. Uh, carboxylic acid, and then I'm going to go to my my website, and I'm going to go to the list of amines. So these are all amines, uh, 1,100 amines from that commercial available library. Go back in here, paste them in there, and then I'm going to um, generate the products. Okay. Took a second because we did 1,100 chemical reactions there. Um, and I remember, I, can, I keep that include reactants box off. Um, and I can view the structures now. Now these all have the chirality preserved from the uh, carboxylic acid. And uh, yeah, so these are kind of unique um, products of that, of that reaction um, that all based on, based on that series of amines that I found that could be evaluated through docking or whatever I wanted to do. Okay. Okay, um, but what I'm gonna do then Instead of docking, which I can't easily do, um, we're just going to take one of them and do the Lipinski uh, Weber analysis, which we did before. Um, and it's pretty easy. So I'm just going to take the top one, get that guy. The very end has some, some text uh, that I'm deleting out. Uh oh. Let's try this again. Copy the smiles. Now I, I go over to that Mole Inspiration website and they have a uh, calculation of molecular properties. Paste the smiles of the molecule we just synthesized. Calculate pro properties. 
So there's the molecule. And then you can see that uh, this actually, as an example, when just kind of arbitrarily picked, it, it does have two violations. Uh, I think the molecular weight, what are, what are the rules? Lipinski rules, um, uh, C log P should be less than or equal to five, but it's at 7.36. So yeah, it's a violation. And then molecular weight's a little high, a little high for Lipinski too. Um, what about Weber rules, rotatable bonds, 19, yeah, that's greater than 10. And then the polar surface area is actually not that bad. Uh, but anyway, this, this would technically be a non-drug-like molecule. Okay, all right, cool. Any questions? All right. So yeah, that's cool. You're gonna do something like this in the next homework also. Um, okay, I'm gonna, maybe I'll try to get through this case study number one real quick. Um, uh, actually, so let's see. Um, maybe, let's try to do this. Um, hopefully, I, I don't wanna do the, the super long, you know, the, they, they said almost three hour lecture. I, I don't wanna do that. What I want to do though is just get through case study one and two. So I'm going to go over our time block a little bit, but that's okay because like last time I uh, was a little bit under, and um, and I just want to finish these two the two case studies. So we might go over ten minutes or something, um, and then I'll probably start the next lecture series as the asynchronous lecture, which is about prodrugs, right? Um, because I do want to get through everything by the end of uh, the course, and and, and we're, we're we're doing pretty good on, on timing. But if you do have to leave at at um, at six fifteen, that's okay. Um, these two these two cool th things are are pretty cool. They're they're real research examples from my laboratory. Okay, so let's see here. All right, so first one, yeah, it's a modeling of. GP41 inhibitors, which is uh, H HIV fusion protein. Uh, this is something we did as a, uh, one of my graduate student projects, uh, maybe five years ago or something. We're, we're still kind of working on it a little bit. Um, so it's the identification of inhibitors of HIV1, GP41, um, and which is a fusion protein. It's, it's one of the proteins that HIV uses to fuse to a, a host cell. Um, so it's an example of in silico synthesis, making ma massive compound libraries, computational docking. We did that in this project. We also did biological evaluation. We also did uh, organic synthesis. So, so we did a little bit of a synthesis, but it was easy synthesis. Um, so HIV, we've talked about HIV. What are the drug targets of HIV? Um, this is one, one depiction of, of kind of how the life cycle of HIV. So the virus um, particles attach to the CD4 receptor on the surface of a, of a, a human immune cell. And basically, after that attachment occurs, the virus kind of attaches and spills out all its uh, contents into the cell, um, including a piece of RNA. And then that gets reverse transcripted into DNA using reverse transcriptase. That gets integrated into the genome. Um, a couple more steps of um, like a, a replication of the virus, um, a couple gene products are created. Eventually, they get created into a new uh, um, a new viral particle through this assembly and budding process. And then proteases come and cleave the long uh, protein strand into all the machinery of, of HIV. Right? Okay, so we can target these with like uh, zytobutene, uh, which is AZT. We could target and also remember, there's these non-nucleotide HIV uh, reverse transcriptase inhibitors and NRTIs. Um, we could also target the protease. That's another thing we can target. Uh, we can also target, there's also, we can also target integrate integration. There's HIV integrase inhibitors as well. But we're gonna, what we're gonna do is talk about this H, this fusion process. So, 
then what if we can block the, the fusion of the viral particle with a CD4 receptor? Well, that would be cool. And that would, that would prevent, that would prevent uh, HIV infection, right? Uh, so one way to do that is this stuff called Fusion, which is this big, long peptide, right? And what's the problem with peptides as drugs? Um, you pr pretty much have to inject it, right? So what? It, so this is not really a good orally available drug. It, it is actually a very good HIV fusion inhibitor, but but you can't use it as an oral drug, be, being a peptide. Um, but this is definitely a very effective HIV treatment. Okay. Uh, and of course, we, we talked about like some of these uh, targets have nice crystal structures like HIV protease has a very good X-ray crystal structure. So we can use docking and things like that to actually create HIV protease inhibitors. Okay. Um, all right, there's another um, depiction of, uh, of how that fusion process works. So the virus has a couple of proteins on it. One's called GP41, one's called GP120. There's these little variable loops. They attach to the CD4 protein on the surface of the, the host cell. And when that happens, the um, <clears throat> GP41 sort of unwinds and it gets kind of opened up and that kind of attaches into the membrane of the, uh, the host cell. Um, and after that happens, the virus really fuses <clears throat> and opens up and all the, the internal molecules in the virus get kind of sucked into the, uh, the host cell. So GP41 is a key player. It's initially buried in this viral envelope of all these proteins. <clears throat> Eventually, it'll penetrate the host membrane. But um, the process is that GP120 first binds to CD4, uh, it's a host immune cell glycoprotein. Uh, and our strategy, though, is basically we're going to use stuff, these molecules, or you can imagine a peptide that'll kind of bind to GP41 and prevent it, this from happening. Uh, GP41 to halt viral fusion. The drug Fusion does that, for example. But could we just do do it with a small molecule? That seems like a reasonable thing, right? Uh, one more depiction of this process. So this shows the virus on the bottom, the host on the top here. So GP41, GP120. GP, CD4 attaches to GP120. Then there's a couple sort of processes that happen, including GP41 opening up and it forms this thing called a six helical, this six helix bundle, which is really interesting. It's, it mechanically um, brings the two things together, right? It's like a, it's like a spring that, that, that attaches the host cell and the viral cell. And then it creates a fusion pore. So what if we designed a monkey wrench, you know, as an analogy, something that breaks, that sticks into the six helical bundle and prevents that fusion process from occurring? Well, then you would prevent HIV viral fusion. Okay, uh, there's this paper called the 30 years on HIV receptor gymnastics and the prevention of infection. So it, it's an easily readable, story about this HIV fusion process as a, as a reference if you're interested in it. Uh, again, the, the steps involve 120, GP120 and GP41. GP120 binds to CD4. 120 changes its shape, increases its affinity to the co-receptor CCR5. It's a different, different protein. GP41 unravels to reveal these helixes, HR1 and HR2. So this is all part of GP41. And then they form, they have this, they, they, they fold in on themselves to make a, a happy bundle. And that mechanically brings the two cells together. It's pretty crazy. HR1 promotes membrane penetration of the host cell. It self assembles to create a fusion pore. And then, and then the fusion pore allows the viral contents to spill in, okay? Uh, Fusion, and hopefully our drugs are trying to design, interfere with this bundling process and prevent HIV uh, viral fusion. Okay, cool. All right, there's Fusion again. All right. So, um, 
So let's talk about our design and synthesis of a peptidomimetic library um, in, of molecules that could, that could uh, bind to GP41. This stuff um, it was before our project. This was done by somebody else. It was actually by Dale Boger at Scripps Institute, which is a you know super um, very accomplished chemist. But we were kind of partially collaborating with Dale Boger. Uh, basically, what they did is they 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 just took a this kind of scaffold. It's a benzene nitro, and they, they and they they call this a peptidomimetic, right? Because this is not a peptide. This does not look like a peptide, but it kind of has a semi peptide peptide structure because you have an amino acid, and then you also have like a second R group. So you have R one and R two, right? Um, and assuming so this is what we call peptidomimetic, right? It, it, it mimics the structure of peptide. You don't want to be exactly like a peptide because it may expose, um, you know, uh, may, may be degraded by proteases and things like that. So a peptidomimetic, if this is able to, if this is able to um, um, bind, then it's, it can actually have, is a beneficial drug scaffold, right? Okay, so what if we have 20 variations of, uh, as I'm saying X and Y, but I really mean R1 and R2. So there's 20 variations of this, 20 variations of that. How many compounds is that? It's 400 compounds, right? They made these 400 compounds as part of their library. Uh, they screened it for GP41. And they found the best compounds had, had aromatic or heteroaromatic ring systems on R1 and R2, right? So kind of benzene or, <clears throat> they also had non-natural amino acids too. So like chlorobenzene, things like that. So benzene, aromatic, heteroaromatic, those are the good ones, right? Okay, this is all before I was involved. Um, how do you make these? Super easy, super easy, right? You can react this cheap building block with these alcohols and sodium hydride. This is a reaction called nucleophilic aromatic substitution. Essentially, the alcohol kicks off the fluorine and then it just attaches. And then we can attach amino acids, deprotect protecting groups, and build this library. They did. They used robots to make do all the synthesis. So they made 400 molecules using automated robotic synthesis. Okay. Okay. So what does their library look like before we were involved? Um, oh yeah. Well, these are the these are the uh, products. They they. Uh, these are the best of the best, and they they had uh, sub micromolar EC50. So, so uh, you know, kind of like 500 nanomolar or something like that. And these are not natural amino acids, right? <laughs> Chlorobenzene is not a nat natural amino acid. Naphthalene is not a natural amino acid, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but the big thing was that these aromatic things were good, right? They they knew that aromatic. Uh, side chains were good. This is a weird amino acid, right? A non-natural amino acid with a naphthalene on it, right? This one is actually a uh, tryptophan. So that's, this is a natural amino acid. But for the most part, these are all non-natural amino acids. Okay, so those are the good ones before we were involved in the project, all right? So um, then I started looking at this as a this, they didn't actually have a, a binding model. So I created a binding model myself using docking. And this shows one of the binding models of like the chlorophenylalanine um, and indol. And it kind of, they bind to this pocket on GP41. And there's actually, a, you can't see it very nicely, but there's a lysine right here. A lysine, a lysine, right? It's an amino, uh, basic amino acid binds to the carboxylic acid. So that we thought of that as a, being a crucial interaction. Carboxylic acid and a basic amino acid would form a nice complementary thing. So that was kind of cool. That we that was kind of the basis of my project idea. Uh, so what is our experimental approach? Our approach was start with that pr previously established 400 inhibitor library not done in our lab. And that binding confirmation that I created, because I, I bound that we, we found a structure of GP41, created this, this hypothetical binding 
conformation. Let's start with their, their compounds. And then do in silico synthesis, create a virtual library of analogs using commercially available synthetic building blocks to make about 6,500 inhibitor candidates, right? So start with their 400 inhibitor library. That's a real library, real compounds. Make 6,500 compounds using in silico synthesis. Six, you know, six thousand ish compounds. Basically, uh, so that we actually have two libraries. One with variation of this this R group over here, and then another library where we keep the best on this side, the indole thing, and do very 500 variations of amino acids here. So 6,000 variations like this, 500 variations like this, and then dock them all, and then make the best of the best uh, of the docked ones, right? So use docking as our pre-screening, and then we make them, make some of them, and then we, and then we do biological evaluation. That was a cool idea of her project, right? Um, okay, so computational docking. So we did docking to replicate the binding mode, see if we can match this binding mode, see if the carboxylic acid goes to the right place by the lysine, pick a subset for synthesis because we, we, we can make amides super easy. And then we, we made 20 of the best. So as a, as a, a graduate student project, we made 20, 20 molecules for, of, for this library. Okay. And then we did biological evaluation. Well, or actually our collaborator did at uh, Toro University. Okay. Um, all right. So the in silico, this is actually, this is a cool little thing. This is before that RD kit thing, or at least I knew about it to do the virtual libraries. So I used a different tool to uh, call it Cytegic Pipeline Pilot. This is another cool tool. I'm just going to show what it looks like. It's a, it's a really neat visual way to build little workflows of like building libraries and stuff like that. The reaction we're exploring is we were going to use acid chlorides and amines as a way to build the amide. Okay, you can also use a, a coupling agent like like. H H B T U or something like that. We we're just assuming, oh yeah, just have a bunch of acid chloride because acid chloride reacts with amines and then we can make these amino acids really easy, these, these coupled products, right? Okay. So we started with about 6,500 amino acids. And in the end, we made about 508 compounds. Why did that happen? Because we did some filtering like Lipinski rules. <laughs> so we did, we did Lipinski filtration as part of the workflow. Uh, ultimately, we got about 95 docked compounds. Okay, um, this, is, this is that, so I was talking about strategic pipeline pilot. This is a cool computer program that lets us um, kind of visually build a workflow of like, it, it reads in our reactions, like a smirks, it reads in the smiles, it does various filtering. It starts building three-dimensional models of all the smile strings. It reads the other smile string. Like, it, so you can see these numbers, 6470. So it, 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 it it uh, loaded in 6470 compounds, and then it did some filtering and changing around. And then we read the smiles of this piece, and then it did this chemical reaction. This is what actually did the reaction. This made the virtual library, eventually making uh, 508 compounds in the end. It added hydrogens, it made three-dimensional coordinates, it ionized the molecules at pH 7.4, it minimized the three-dimensional structure, and then it created a, an output. So th this is, I mean, what's cool about this is it's a, it's a visual way to like do a whole bunch of stuff. And it's like, it's like a little computer program and I, I can drag and drop these little machines and they do, do stuff. So this is another cool program. This one sadly costs a ton of money now. It's like a thousand dollars a year or something like that. If you work for a drug company, you'll, you'll get access to this, but sadly, in the old days, it was totally free for us. Now it's, I can't even use it anymore. Okay. All right. So that's one thing we did. And then I did the other thing 
which was start with the amino acid attached and then assume different alcohols would get attached. And then we make a virtual library of these peptidomimetics. So here we started with 2.3 million compounds. We fed them in 2.3 million primary alcohols, right? That makes sense. There's probably, probably about 2.3 million primary alcohols that we can easily get. Um, this eventually created uh, about 5,600 compounds. And then we successfully docked about 585 of those. Okay, so this just shows, just for fun, this uh, analogous pipeline pilot script that we created. And so we re read in the reaction, we read in those 60, uh, no, that's not right. This, uh, this is a little, this isn't exactly right. This, this, this um, I, I think my screenshot was wrong, but basically, yeah, we started two and three million compounds, did the whole process. And then, then these, these numbers are accurate, but I think my, my screenshot got messed up here. So. Um, but this program will easily deal with millions of compounds as I feed them through. Okay, let's get through the results. Um, so these are some of the ones we discovered. Um, so these are these are uh, natural or th these are these have non-natural amino acids. That is not a normal am amino acid. Um, it's actually a, it's not even an amino, uh, well, it's, it's a very, it has a weird structure. This is not like a, a phenylalanine or something. It has a pyrazine. A pyrazine is a weird heterocycle with two nitrogens on it. But this is one of our docking hits. And then it had the indole on the other side. Um, this one, a quinoline. What's a quinoline? It's a, it's a two, a, you know, like, like a phenylalanine, but it's got an extra benzene. And it's got the nitrogen in there. So this is a very weird non-natural amino acid. This was discovered as one of our hits also. Um, S-benzyl cysteine. So this is essentially cysteine, which is CH2 sulfur, but with a benzyl group on it. So this is also a non-natural amino acid that we, we discovered through docking. Bach-protected ornithine. So this is a Bach group. It's a Bach protecting group of ornithine, which is a kind of a semi-natural amino acid that we, that's not one of the, nat, the common ones, it, uh, but, but, it, but the, the Bach group is attached to the amine. And this is kind of a greasy, uh, you know, protecting group. It's usually used as a protecting group, but here it's actually part of the molecule. And also the carboxylic acid is positioned at the right place. So that was cool. Um, Okay, so then we basically uh, took the library and, and we uh, screened it against a binding comp competition assay of GP41. Um, and we got uh, KI values, which are roughly the idea of an IC50. It's lower is better. Okay, so this shows essentially the library we created um, and the different R chains off the the ether linkage up top. So we have indole, we have naphthalene, and we have a four chloro uh, phenyl. And then we had all these kind of weird non-natural amino acids that we discovered through docking on the uh, on this part of the table. And essentially the bottom line is, uh, was we found, we found a compound with actually a pretty good Ki value. So this is about 200 nanomolar. Um, and it, it has a weird uh, non-natural amino acid. It's like cyclohexane, methyl cyclohexane. It's like a phenylalanine, but minus the, without the double bonds, right? So that was kind of cool. And uh, that was basically where we got in this project. And then my student graduated. Um, we are still planning to publish this. Um, this is actually a pu totally publishable result. We, we've been uh, lagging a little bit on this. So uh, there's my student, Michael Pun. He got his PhD at University of Washington. Uh, Miriam Gawkin and, and myself. So, so this we're, we are planning to publish this pretty soon. I, you know, I actually have a second, uh, a second case study, which I'm probably what I'm going to do is what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop today. Um, 
And I'm going to do this case study next time uh, in person. And then, I, uh, but for now, what I'm going to do in my, in my asynchronous lecture is I'm going to jump, jump into the pro drug stuff because we have a lot of, a lot of pro drug stuff to do. Um, so what we're probably going to do is asynchronous uh, tonight is going to be the uh, pro drug stuff. And then I'm going to next week and come back to case study number two, which is another cool modeling project. And then we're going to continue with the pro drug stuff. It's a little, a little disjointed, but I think it's going to be, um, it's going to be, um, it'll, I, I kind of want to want to be talking to you guys face to face for a case study too, because it's a pretty cool project. It's another th more recent project we, we've been doing that actually has some cool, cool stuff also. All right. Um, any questions about the, the HIV thing? Or any of those uh, the synthesis stuff, or the uh, I don't know. It's kind of some kind of fun, fun things. I mean, it's it's interesting that we can do synthesis um, in computer, especially if you combine that with something like docking or you know, whatever. All right. Not seeing any questions. All right. It was kind of kind of some interesting stuff. Hopefully, you guys found it interesting as well. Um, case study two, two will be fun, um, and we'll do that. We'll do that next time. And asynchronous lecture, I'm going to jump just jump into the pro drug stuff, which is uh, that's a pro drugs are a very interesting thing. Um, we'll do a lot of real examples of commercially available pro drugs, and I think you'll, you guys will find it interesting. All right. I'm going to stop now and stop sharing. All right, have a wonderful night. And I'll get that second uh, lecture going here pretty soon and we'll upload everything tomorrow. Um, all right, see you guys, bye-bye. I have a question. Would it be okay um, if I could email you regarding the homework? Uh, what was the question? I'll have a question regarding the homework. Yeah, 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 totally. Um, so for would it I would, would it be okay if I can screenshot to you? I'm sorry. Would it be okay if I can share a screen to you? Yeah, let me see if I can figure it out. Okay. Um, I can. I'll uh, make you a co-host. Okay. Bro, bro. Okay. I typed the. Let me see. Sorry. Oh, sorry for the background. Okay. Let me see if I can share my screen. Okay. Are you able to see it? Yep. Okay. So, this is the question I have regarding my homework. Um, I think it's this one, homework, this one. Yeah, so for part one, I realized that when I was trying to figure out this second part, um, I, um, I don't know whether it should be FMO or P450 because it was like a second, it was the second, um, very evident, I mean, I think, or a nitron, because like, you know how like a secondary amine, um, turns into a, nit a nitron, so it requires FMA, FMO and P450. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's actually that's interesting. It's probably yeah. It's probably uh, it's probably both actually. I okay. Think I think it's. I'd probably just write both. I mean, because it's it's doing a it's doing an, an oxidation and also a C oxidation. So yeah, it's probably probably a, a combination of both of those. That's that's an interesting point. I I, I guess I didn't realize that. Okay, um, so I can just put both then because I realized that um, when it comes to two answers, there's two arrows. That's why like I was questioning. Oh, oh um, let me see here. Yeah, I probably should have two arrows for that one. And I just realized, I guess I didn't do that. Okay. Yeah, I probably just write <laughs> okay. both, I guess. Yeah, yeah, thanks for noticing that. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. I'm okay. so sorry. Okay, see ya. Bye-bye. All right, bye.